Aha! Uh -huh. Hello! How are you all? Paul O'Neill here with Pitch BTCC. Ah, what a beautiful day! It's all good, eh? It's all good. Um, it's like Christmas here. It's like Christmas in Witness. I'm, uh, I've got myself some new cleats for my bike. They've just turned up today. So shout out to my bro, Ross. He sorted us right out and uh, got me these cleats. Um, right, got Tom Chilton on. How cool is that? He's like, he's like a, he's like the David Beckham of British touring cars. I know he's watching, so I'm going to get him in in a second. He's requested to be on, so I will press the button in a minute. But um, I just want to fire into him while he's not actually on the screen. No, I'm joking. Um, let's have a chat with him. Can't wait. He's such a good guy. Love him to bits. Always been a lovely lad. Um, but first, wa watch this. Alexa, who is the best driver in the BTCC? Here's something I found on the web. According to Autosport.com, Bobby Thompson is their only driver confirmed. Alexa, cancel. That is wrong information. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. Right. Tom Chilton. Tommy. Here he is, waiting for Tom Chilton. Waiting for the connection of the biggest superstar in British touring cars. He must have, like, the worst connection in the world. Let's see if he comes on anyway. Yeah, so anyway, as I was saying, he's a proper lad. Um, I've had some real good races with him over the years. It's been an absolute pleasure to drive with him. He's been in touring cars, I think, for, like, I think this might be his 18th year or maybe the 19th year, um, which is unbelievable. And BTC Racing, who have just... Uh, oh, my God. Oh, we're in. You're in. Do you want to do, do me a favour and... Um, before you come on, don't blow torch like a bar. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what, mate? The weather's absolutely insane, but obviously having three boys, I've got to be outside with them kicking a ball, gardening, all sorts of things you've got to do as a dad. And uh, yeah, the, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing factor 50. Well, what can I say, mate? I tan. <laughs> uh, do you know what? It's, it's a, the sign of getting older, you know, because I've just been in the shops. I went to Tesco before. And uh, I ended up getting some Factor 50 because, honestly, mate, if I don't wear Factor 50 five minutes in, the top of me baldy heat goes burning. I'm, like, burning on my shoulders. I'm just <laughs> I'm so old. I may as well give up on life. It's horrendous, isn't it? I'm, I'm, still, I'm still in shock, by the way. I, I was watching before I came on live. I'm still in shock. I've got an Alexa. I can't shout, or otherwise it will start doing stuff in my, be in my, uh, in my lounge. I can't believe you just said, who's the best British touring car driver? And it said Bobby Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in shock. It can't spell James Thompson. That's obviously what's wrong with it. <laughs> Wait, though. It says something like, it says something like, according to Autosport, Bobby Thompson is the only person who's signed up. Now listen to this one sec. Alexa, who is the best BTCC driver? Lately, it's been all about Andy Rouse. It's been oh, about Andy Rouse. Well, you've got a different... I mean, Andy Rouse, Bobby Thompson. <laughs> it just heard your voice on my iPhone and just it just started doing its thing. That's hilarious. Okay. No, if I wasn't on Pitch BTCC's app, I would ask Alexa. If, no, it hasn't done it. It's okay. If, if, they, all right, if they could count to um, a certain number in Welsh, because it is not a good thing, mate. Have you heard about that? <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you offline later on, mate. I'll tell you offline. <laughs> um, I, I can't believe, mate, that... Um, so in 2002, I remember seeing this weird fringed little chubby kid walking up the pit lane on media day when I was, I was the big news, mate. I was the big deal. And uh, <laughs> when I was driving for egg, everyone was like, yeah, there's Tom Chilton. He, has, he hasn't even like driven on the road yet and he's going to win. I was like, yeah, whatever, mate. Bang. First round on the podium. Wanted to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> how, old, how old were you? You were young. How old were you back in 2002? I was 22 and you were 16, were you 17? Uh, just turned 17 by two weeks, yeah. Yeah, isn't that nuts, man? The, the nuts. time just goes, doesn't it? Oh, it's crazy. I can't believe where it's gone. It's, uh, it's crazy. And, and, and I mean, listen, look, mate, this is how long you've been racing. 
I have been outside all day doing all making my, notes, making my notes on your career, mate. Oh, yeah. um, which I don't usually do. To be fair, I do I do a lot of it, but because yours is so vast, there's some things that you know I didn't want to miss out. And like I say, I know you've only got limited time because you've got a family and stuff, mate. But there was some you know important things I wanted to ask that. Uh, you know, maybe you've covered before, but I know you pretty well. We've worked together as well. Um, but yeah, back in... We had, just for everyone watching, me and Paul did the best ever hot laps for VXR racing back in the day when I was at AAA. Oh my <laughs> day, we had so much fun. These people used to get in and trust us, obviously. Um, but they didn't realise that me and Paul were like, we had a little show going on. And we used to pretend that each other was hitting each other off up the straight. So we'd all make each lap so it was fair. But one lap, we'd be up the straight and 50. And I'd look across at my passenger at like 140 and I'm on the grass before you have to break for like a hairpin and be like, what's he doing? What's he doing? We're going to die. And then they go, yeah, we're going to die. Mate, on a serious note, I do not know to this day how we, one, didn't, I think we touched once into the chicane, but uh, wing mirror to wing mirror in course of VXRs. And, yeah, which is mint, but yeah. we used to be swerving at each other down Halewood Hill or whatever it's called at, uh, at uh, Thruxton. And uh, do you know what I remember the most? The funniest thing I remember, it was a, it was a lovely lady called Linda Unsworth, used to employ us, didn't she? Yeah, she was great. And we had a right crap for Vauxhall. And uh, like, it was my highlight of my year, like working not just with you, but the, the lads and the girls who were there um, instructing. And we were like cutting through all the traffic. And do you remember, we were at Thruxton and we had these two, we used to go through tyres like, it was going out of fashion, tyres every, well, probably about 15 laps. We're on it was crazy, wasn't it? Canvas and left, yeah. Down to the canvas and like, you'd have to, but you, you didn't check it, you just felt it as you come through <laughs> church. <laughs> boop, 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 under and then then go. did you go flat through it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my word, it's like days of thunder. Uh, and I remember we, we come in the pits, didn't we? And, uh, Anyway, we used to take the promotional staff out, like the girls and the lads who were working on the event for TRO or Vauxhall or whoever. And uh, I remember if we didn't have a passenger, we'd just follow that person out just to make a race. And I followed you out. And there was a lap I thought, I think we might have lost Tom Chilton. He's he going to die. Because you went through a <laughs> 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 Properly backwards in, in fifth gear. Them things couldn't get six. Like backwards at 120. Come through, straighten it up. I just remember your your beautiful white teeth smiling and your lovely face just like, Whoa! and I was like, what a man. And then I got down to the chicane and had a run on you. You squeezed me on the grass. It was about five to five at night when they were trying to shut the circuit. <laughs> they, were, they were coning the circuit off to get us off the circuit. And I hit the curb behind you and the car had <laughs> two wheels and I had to turn the other way. And it nearly went on its route with me on my own and you were the guest just going, you guys are crazy. <laughs> we got away with murder though literally oh, good time weren't they cool times i remember the biggest problem we had at silverstone was when we were going down the back straight on the national circuit when we were flicking it into brooklyn's uh the left-hander uh -huh. we would give it the pendulum flick but the problem was if you were below quarter of a tank of fuel when you went to floor it to pull it out the slide the engine just stalled because of the fuel <laughs> you know like fuel tank so <laughs> <laughs> you, when, it, when it cut out it's like you floor it and we're like we're gonna spin and we're going in the gravel we've run out of fuel <laughs> so we relied on the power to pull us out the slide we were that backwards every lap it was beautiful so much fun you know what just i'll just tell you another quick one there was one when we got it so perfect in them astra nurberg ring things with the proper loud exhaust on yeah and we come out, we come out of um, the pit lane at uh brands <laughs> And we were, we were Scandi flicking it before we got to Paddock in fourth. Yeah. And, and it had tyre shine on it, didn't it, for the first run. So like, uh, yeah. I remember coming down and you were through the gravel. <laughs> like, I was like mortified, like trying to get away from you, thinking he's coming <laughs> in the door. And that was like, that was about seven minutes past nine in the morning. And I was like, yeah. we've got a load more things to do today. <laughs> oh, my word, mate. Yeah. Those days. But I don't want to go on about that too much, but... I'll tell you one of the funniest things I've ever seen in one of them days, and it wasn't you because you were driving for somebody else, and you might have been at Halford, I think, and Onslow Cole pitched up, yeah. your, your old teammate. Mm. And um, I got, you know, you don't tell a touring car driver how to do a passenger ride. You're just like, no, mate. But 
Linda Unsworth, who was overseeing us at Vauxhall, said, Paul, can you do us a favour? Tell him the do's and don'ts. Um, and just, you know, just make sure you don't go too fast like you've been going with Tom, but you guys know each other. I was like, absolutely fine. Tom Onslow Cole, ladies and gentlemen, first flying lap of the day. Behind me, this is at Brands Hatch. There's another one, which I'll tell you about another time. Alton Park. Alton Park. I'll tell him the Brands Hatch one, and then just quickly tell him the old power. Brands Hatch, he's come up behind me, and we're like, we're having a little bit of a battle, just finding out whereabouts we are. And I said to him before we left the pit lane, Watch out for the tyre shine. It's caught the best of us out. I've spun on it. Tom's been in the gravel with it. Um, I said, and when you're overtaking the other guests who are driving the car themselves with instructors, don't lunge them. Just don't do it. If you see me not overtaking them, don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, mate. Perfect. Cool. Got the lap out of the way. Went again. He loved a guy called Howard Hunt, who was <laughs> angriest man in the world who coaches. And then... The, the driver who was driving just got one in the door from Onslow Coast. <laughs> him spinning down the paddock of bed. He overtook me and smacked into him. Uh, and then he's gone up the... the I, I'm like, what? So I've gone past him like like, like like a chicane because there's just cars in like mangled everywhere down paddock of bed. And then as I've gone up the road, he selected a suitable cog, got going. I've looked in the mirror and Onslow Coast trying to finish the passenger ride like with his headlights like that. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Howard Hunt comes down the road and he's like, I'm going to kill you. He's trying to smash oh, you in the mate. face. And I was like, Brilliant. Oh, so that's our hot laps. So funny. <laughs> mate, amazing, so funny. amazing. Um, but do you, do you know what? British touring cars is, is very much... Um, the same, isn't it, as as, uh, as those days where... <laughs> the XR hot ride lap, yeah. Yeah, what did I say? Oh, sorry? Did I say BMW then? I can't no, remember no, what I said. no, 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 you said BTCC is just like, and then I it, said, yeah, the VXR track days. They are exactly the same. And the, Brilliant. I cannot get my breath about how, how long I've known British Touring Cars, and you started in 2002, the same year, the same day as me. We both hit the track at Brands GP for qualifying. Mm. Um, and you qualified, I reckon you qualified fifth. You had a real good run in the sprint race. Um, and I remember seeing you and I was like, this boy's hot, like he good, and you were you had a big PR machine behind you, and and I was quite quiet back then, so I didn't really say anything. And I was with Egg Triple Eight, and you were in a, a car that was a year old with not the best development in the world, um, with Barwell, who were a good team, weren't they? Yeah. Um, but you had a great race. You were on the podium first ever. You were the youngest person to ever get on the podium um, back in the day, mate. And seventeen, not driven on the roads, and I was third. I did have to fire off Tim Harvey and Anthony Reid to get there, but I did it. And then Evan Muller had a puncher, which helped. And I, I nearly wiped him out, actually. Do you, old... do, you not remember, do you not remember what happened while you were on the podium? Because I was, I was down the inside of Dan Eves for second place at Clearways on the last lap. And I, went, I had a left front puncher like Evan and went straight in the wall. I, yeah. Horrendous. It all happened. Yeah, I remember that, mate. It was... Um... Tim Harvey. You, you really made a you really made a splash, didn't you, when you smashed into the back of Tim Harvey at Drew? I this day, all right. I this day, he braked he, two meters he, too early. He braked two meters too early, and I wasn't lifting off that throttle until my brake point. So I was seventeen years old. I wasn't like now, where I can like look miles ahead and see what idiots in front and just figure it out. Back when I was seventeen, I was like, no, that blade of grass is when I brake. And he braked too early. I was still full throttle. Boof. <laughs> and that's what. That's the honest you know. for a brake point because I was so young. And he braked too early, so I hit him. That was it. <laughs> I, as much as I loved him to bits, I loved Tim Harvey. Like, he's a real good guy, proper precious fella. But the, about three laps before, I'd come from 16th to get to third place, and I tried to move on him at Paddock, and he proper, like, proper tried to have me off. And I was like, oh, God. I don't know if I like this fella. I used to be, I used to love him when he was in the Volvo, but now I'm racing against him. I really don't like this guy. And then I heard about what happened to you in the onboard of him, like with all his like, all his fat going. <laughs> <laughs> oh mate, those were the days. But... Tim, watching, I'm really sorry, mate. And we're best mates now, and I'm sorry. All right, I was seven. <laughs> right, I was driving on the road. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> oh, don't worry about, don't worry about Tim. He won't be bothered, mate. He'll be just. He'll be just like, I don't know, selling watches or on a bike track day somewhere. He don't do anything. Don't worry about him. Um, but yeah, and listen, what, what, a, uh, what a debut season. Um, 
unbelievable, mate. Did you feel the pressure, or was it because you were a youngster, you weren't too bothered? There was nothing that seemed to phase you, to be honest, mate. I was a good teammate. I was re- I was really relaxed to that first. That I genuinely remember that first race because um, my my driver coach and manager at the time, Andy, uh, he got me to do all the things which you know Ed and Senna used to do. So it's like close your eyes and stop watch and do the lap your eyes shut. And I would do that and like I'd then fall asleep on the grid before the start of the race. Then open my eyes. Then you got the grid girl stood in front of you and it's like oh right we're going. All right, mate, steady. I remember yeah, I know. I was like oh I best go. And I remember, I remember I was really relaxed to the point there was a safety car in that race. Um, and I do remember behind the safety car, I ended up strumming the steering wheel. Um, I disappeared, Tom. You have. You've gone black screen on my phone. I don't know why. That's weird. Why is that? That's oh, you're, back. you're back, yeah. Oh, oh, you're but, but I you remember know. strumming the steering wheel like this, like actually singing a song. I can't remember what song it was. Um, but it might have been Chris Rear Road to Hell, I don't know. But I was strumming a song on the steering wheel while driving around the GP circuit, waiting for the uh, the lights to go out and the safety car and then get close to whoever was in front of me. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I was so relaxed. Now I'm thinking, oh, I've got to get the right brake temperature, tyre temperature, pressure, like ready to start the race. I'm thinking about loads of other things now because I know so much more than back then. I was just like, duh, 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 duh. oh, when's it going to start again? I had no idea. Um, it's crazy, isn't it? When you're yeah. a youngster. But you just what? Crack on. what? What a weekend, mate. But then, so you got a podium really because of me, because I crashed out with a puncher. And then round two, you had a massive shunt because of me going up to Druids. Tim Harvey turned me round, going up to Druids in fifth gear, turned me left, right. I think I might have hit someone else. They hit you and you fired yourself up into the grandstand. And I was like, welcome, mate. <laughs> Hope it for, for a great time. Yeah. <laughs> Horrendous, mate. Nice. Absolutely. Those are the days, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, listen, um, when the funny thing I found was I always uh, I always look back at 2002 for myself as as a you know a year where it's free. You know, you, you're just there. No, you just get on with it. And I say that to a lot of the new drivers coming in, like your James Gornals, people like that. <clears throat> Nobody will remember your first season. It's just like it's free. Just get on with it. See how you get on. But people judge you on your second season, don't they? And you yeah. moved to Honda with Arena, um, and pff, mate, you put yourself up against some proper people that year. <laughs> I had I had some big shoes to fill. You know, I had I had um, Alan Morrison who kind of set up the whole gig originally um, when Honda. I was Andy Prior in the first year because Alan Morrison was riding in the British Superbike um, and a British Motocross Championship. Sorry, British Motocross Championship for Honda, um, and he was um, British champion and he was Honda, 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 and he set this whole gig up. Andy Prio, as we all know, is a legendary driver. He was teammates with him. Andy left. And then it was Matt Neal and me who came in to make it a three-car team. Now, Matt Neal, obviously, is a legend. And I had Alan Morrison, who wasn't successful as such in cars, but he had so much feel from the bikes. He had massive natural raw talent. And I was 18, and I had to, like, play literally with the big boys. But what was perfect was they were both very experienced and I ended up learning an awful lot from them, whether it was good or bad. <laughs> you know, I learned an awful lot. Morrison was uh, obviously from Northern Ireland and uh, was uh, a bit of a prankster. I'd sometimes be struggling to get in the car because he's done about 83 tight knots on my race boots. And I'm trying to undo them all to get in the car before I could <laughs> used to break in the throttle. <laughs> like the stories were so funny. <laughs> Ask Matt Neal, were so funny. And Matt Neal would have his lucky T-shirt or his lucky, lucky pants, whatever it was. And Morrison would go and burn them or hide them or something <laughs> it's just like so I, I was going to ask you about that tom so i remember matt neil telling me when it had happened in 2003 we were at mondello park and they got you to drive into town to go out for a couple of drinks obviously yeah. you weren't drinking i don't know if they were but didn't morrison pull the handbrake from the passenger seat yeah. and the police pulled you <laughs> no this no, this, this wasn't Mondo Park. This was actually um, the TT for the Isle of Man. We out, went out there with um, uh, Neil and, uh, and all of the, the bike boys. And uh, whoa, what a wild night that was. I had a transit van full of policemen behind me on the seafront, full for the TT. And it was like about 3 a.m. We're heading back to the hotel. And yeah, you're right. I wasn't drinking, but the other two were off their faces. And they looked at each other in the mirror. I was looking at each other in the back seat. I looked at my mirror and I was thinking, look at these two kids like giggling, looking at each other. And then they just both leant forwards and grabbed the handbrake. 
they're so strong, both of them. I can't get the hands off. And I'm like, there's a police car behind. So I'm full throttle in a Honda Stream, full throttle, <laughs> trying to keep it at 30 miles an hour. Because I was like, it's got to stay at 30. It's got to stay at 30. And the engine started dying and I'm on full throttle. I'm like, oh, it's starting to get slower. But the smoke pouring off the back with this smoke. Woo! The blue lights come on. And then it was this fist. I'll never forget it, man. I look right. It was Ryan Drive, obviously, and the fist on the window. Doo, 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 and I'm like, it's like evening officers. And these two are in the back, Matt and Alan going, <laughs> like little children in the back, like giggling their heads off. Uh, and like, um, it's like, uh, excuse me, do you, do, you, do you know what's going on? You've got a lot of smoke coming out the back. I was like, yeah, these two kids are pulling my handbrake. Really sorry. They're obviously drunk. I'm taking them home. And they let me off. And I thought, you nutters. Anyway, it was fine. We got away with it. That was lucky. But the best story was the bit just going into our hotel. So, you know, you can get those cattle grids to stop all the sheep or the cows from leaving. Yeah. There was a cattle grid on the entry to the driveway, this, this long driveway to this hotel. And it's true, it's big oak posts each side, right? You don't want to hit one of these posts, all right? And a Honda Stream, as we all know, is quite a long car. <laughs> Ugly and long. <laughs> and literally, I flicked it in. I flicked it into this corner and obviously Morrison knew I'd gone in quite fast and thought it was a perfect time to pull the handbrake. Three in the morning, pitch black, you're relying on your headlights. We're going completely sideways. I'm currently looking at trees, full throttle again, trying to pull this thing around, <laughs> trying to judge it with a lock and ended up with the stream. I'm not joking, it must have been about a foot front of the bonnet, foot from the rear of the bonnet, sideways, brrr, over the cattle grip of the post front and rear. I missed them both. And they went, why? And it's like, Irish, that worked well. <laughs> Where's he from? Wiltshire. Yeah, exactly. I can't do accents, but. <laughs> I, well, I have for crack. That was good. Yeah, I, I can't do it. Oh, mate, isn't he? Alan Morrison, if people don't know Alan Morrison, I it's remember hard. he's just an absolute animal, but yeah. a lovely guy, a, such a funny fellow. And Matt Neal, I think they're very good friends still, but they are, he, yeah. he holds him in really high regard. But that story of you with the handbrake went round the paddock and we were all dying laughing. Every, all the drivers were like, no way, Chilton's been stitched up a kipper by them too, because they're, they're big fellas. You would never mess with Alan Morrison and I wouldn't want to crack off Matt Neal either with his, whatever that is, big what? So <laughs> them two boys, <laughs> them two boys are nutters. But I'm going to take you to, was it Snetterton or Croft, where you nearly qualified one, two, three in the arena Hondas. I, there was a uh, really but you nearly got NSXs each? Uh, that was Rockingham. Was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happened? Did you, did you not qualify yeah. one, two, three, Tom? No, it's one, two, four. <laughs> four. Uh, I, think, I can't remember who split you up. It was probably Tom. It was, was where you probably. finished. It was where you finished the race. And uh, I ended up outbreaking myself being 18 and still learning at that horrible hairpin. And... Uh, I went straight through the grass and I, I think I've dropped down to about sixth or something. But I pulled it back up through the fields to fourth. But nevertheless, it wasn't a one, two, three. It was a one, two, four. So they both wanted to kill me because we didn't have NSXs. But I was really happy with my Civic Type R, you know. I had more mates in the back going out for a night out in the nightclub because I was 18. So it didn't bother me as much. Right. But, yeah. what, a what, what, a life, what, what a life to have as a British touring car driver at that age. It, uh, did it cause any problems um, being 18? 19. No. no, no problems at all. No, not no. with the women. No problems at all. No. <laughs> no problems at all, mate. Absolutely nada. No. Hey, do you know what? I, I feel like I've been very lucky, like, on the whole in my life, um, with everything from motorsport to um, my family. It's all gone really well. And uh, obviously, Max is doing the best he can do as well, and Indy cars now, and uh, I just feel like motorsport was everything I needed. You know, I was this overweight child who, let's be honest, I wasn't, I, w I wasn't due to be anything other than a fat kid who maybe played the saxophone. I don't know what I was going to do. And I had no real goals or ambition. And then I, I, I got into motorsport and it gave me this goal, this passion and this fire inside every day. I just wanted to get up, get fit. Um, and uh, I wanted to be the best. And to be the best, you've got to work hard, just like you're doing right now with cycling is what, I'm basically having to do at the moment and uh you know what it's like when you start training and getting that sort of goal and passion you start getting fit again you feel good and you live on that adrenaline as you know me I'm I'm always excited I'm 35 and I'm as excited now as I was when I was 17 but I've got so much adrenaline and that's what I live on um and I wouldn't change it for the world motorsport is the best 
best sport in the world. Yeah, there's some downs, but the ups are the best when you get them. As you know, mate, you were in tears at Alton Park, but <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Terrible. Listen, I, that's a, it's a great thing you just said that, Tom. Um, and that's why, I'll be dead honest, mate, you know me, I'm honest. Uh, that's why I really like you, fella. You've never, um, you know, you've never, you never shied away from a challenge. You've had some of the best teammates that I can ever, ever, ever think of in British and world. Um, and there was one thing I was going to ask you about and you touched on. Um, because, like yourself, you know, uh, I struggle a bit with my weight if I'm not completely focused on something. Um, and you can go a bit wayward. And how difficult has that been? Because, uh, you know, as, as funny as we make it, it's not actually funny, is it, mate, when you've got, you know, um, uh, you know a career that, that you have to make sure you're in tip-top condition. And I just always remember you every winter flat out training, you know, trying to get the best out of yourself. But as a kid, was it, was it hard work? Because there'll be a lot of people watching this, mate, who will be in the same boat. And what tips can you give to people for motivation and things like that? So, yeah, it's, I've always been fighting my weight. You're right. I always have to lose a lot of weight before the season starts because I just, as soon as the season finishes, I go, I just want to be me. I just want to eat what I want to eat. And I don't need to be training every day because I'm not racing for like, you know, three, four months over the winter. So I literally just let myself be me, um, which isn't good because I put on like two stone. But I have to get it all back again. And I think it's really important to not always be flat out the whole time because you need to let your body have a rest. I think that's really important. And it's good to have a life and enjoy it. You know, life is about living. And so I very much do that and mm. uh, have a lot of fun with my kids and family. And then I get back into the, the, the new season. I've got the new car. We've got the new development program, new winter test program, and bang, I'm back on it again. And that gives me that fire and that fight. Um, but consistency is what I would say to everybody is the key. Um, don't think you can go out and do a really hard any form of exercise once and that's it you're going to lose loads of weight and get really fit doesn't happen you're better off backing off and going nice and easy and doing it every sort of every other day if you like uh, consistency is the key um and then i find if i can do a double session in a day that really helps my metabolism and also um, my diet if i'm doing a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon i'm really strict on my diet because I think, well, I've done all this effort. Um, and also, I'm, when, you, when you train that much as well, you end up not being as hungry as if you do like one every three days. You actually feel like you're more hungry. And that sounds crazy. But for me, if I train more, I'm less hungry, um, especially if you're not doing flat out training. So if you do once every three days flat out, you're hungry. And you feel like, oh, I've just trained hard. I deserve a chocolate bar or a pizza or whatever it is. Um, but if you're training regularly, little and often, you end up, having a little and often uh, sort of uh, food you intake. So, and, and, and getting the nutrition is absolutely key. And I've got the best nutritionist at the moment, a guy called Joe Beer, um, who does a lot of work with CIS, science and sport, and looks after oh, yeah. lots of Olympic athletes. <clears throat> and uh, he's great. He's really taught me an awful lot of my nutrition and diet. And since Christmas, I've lost 24 pounds in weight, which is quite a lot. Um, but I'm training now. I'm, I'm doing a lot of nose breathing. I'm not ever opening my mouth. I'm just cruising. You know, Who just... you are Jason Plato. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's important. If you've ever raced with a, a heart rate monitor on, you know what your heart rate is. You need to try and train at that. And don't train 180 beats a minute. If I, I race, by the way, so everyone here knows, I race in the middle of a race on a hot day, I'm 134 beats a minute. So that's, I think that's quite low for a lot of drivers, but that's where I'm at when I'm racing. On the grid, it's like sort of 70 beats a minute because you've got a little bit of adrenaline in there. Then when you actually get going, mine goes up to about 134. So I try and train around there. And yeah, you have like little bursts and hills where you go obviously higher, but predominantly I try and keep it at that, which is a real fat burn sort of zone one <clears throat> and try not to go too much into zone two is my kind of area. And that really helps me keep the weight off. And, uh, and it's great. And you get no injuries. You're not starving. Um, so that's, that's the thing for me at the moment. You know, fair play, mate. And, you know, well answered as well. Because I just think it's fascinating. And I, I was interesting hearing you say about not going at it flat out, you know, trying to lose like half a stone in a week. <clears throat> that's what we did as kids, wasn't it? It just doesn't happen. You've got to be consistent, like you say, and, and try and you just you know, back off the portions and, 
and just softly, softly at the minute. And it, and I think the lockdown for me personally has helped because, and I've seen Louise had asked the question, has it been difficult to train with lockdown? It, it's different for you because, I mean, your family takes up quite a lot of your time. You've got, you've got three yeah. left around the house, haven't you? <clears throat> yeah, so I've got a, a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, all boys. Uh, and uh, obviously at the moment with homeschooling, it's quite busy. Um, and I'll tell you what, we're, 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 we're doing schoolwork from sort of 7.45 in the morning. And we've usually, by the time we've gone through all three children and got everything done, it's usually about sort of three o'clock where we're finished. So it's a full day of looking after the kids. But obviously boys being boys at that age, their attention span's quite small. So you've got to let them go and play as well. Um, mm. It's really hard trying to juggle it at the moment. And I can't wait. They sh they're all going back to school on Monday. So uh, uh, the, I'm really excited on Monday because I get to go back to doing what I'd say is double sessions training again. Whereas at the moment, I can only get sort of one session in the morning um, if they haven't got too much work planned. Uh, but when they go back to school, I can actually get two sessions a day, in, which I've missed. I've not done that since before lockdown. Um, I got really, really fit just before media day um, at Silverstone. Um, I actually was getting dressed in the moto and I've actually got the little bit sticking in on the sides of my tummy, which I haven't had in years. Like, I've Is that your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, when, you get, when you start getting fit again, you don't want to lose it all. And I kind of, I haven't lost it all. I'm still bashing out quite good times and everything at the moment, but I'll, I'm definitely not quite as trim as I was because it's, it, the consistency struggles a bit with, with family life. And I'm very honest about it. But the beauty is now is the kids go back on Monday and I can actually get back to doing double sessions a, a day. And that gives me enough time before August the 1st, plenty of time to get really, really fit. I want to get back down to 13 and a half stone. Um, I was at 16 stone at Christmas. And I reckon I can get down to 13 and five, I reckon, before August 1st. So uh, that's the plan. That's amazing, isn't it? Like, you know, just to tell you, but I was 16 stone three in the middle of March and I think I'm 15 stone one I think now just and like that was from the biking and stuff but it's different for me because I live on my own I just couldn't it's, you know how you answered that's fantastic because I just don't know how people uh you know can get through it and there's people watching this mate who'll take a, a lot of info from from what you've just said because it's not just you know we spoke about it before it's not just the weight and things it's it's mentally isn't it, it it's it's what is going on up here if you don't feel right if you haven't got them bits that you you know you're sticking in that you were telling you know you were telling us about um and how you feel about your own body it has a it has a massive effect on on your brain and when you're racing a car isn't it massive effects and I, I like i'm gutted the swimming pools are shut at the moment um because of covid but if i can get in the swimming pool and be the first in the pool at sort of six six thirty in the morning I always get in sort of first in the pool and I think any of the other British touring car drivers training right now at this time in the morning, probably not. They're probably later on. So I like to think that I'm already the first in the pool of all the drivers and I'm one step ahead. And when I get to a racetrack, I try and run around the circuit and I always try and feel like I'm one step ahead of everyone else. When I sign on, I try and sign on first sometimes, <laughs> try and leave the pit lane first. But, you know, they change all that with the rules now. But Everything in my mind is, is every, everything I go about on a race weekend is so that I'm number one because there's no point in turning up unless you're going to be number one. And in all my life, I've always tried very hard to, to get the most out of myself and the team and, and the car. And, uh, and there's a lot of mind games in it as much as I'm just me and I'm, you know, I'm completely honest about everything. I've never, I've never lied about a setup in my debriefs. I've always been honest that that works. That is the best setup. Some drivers try and lie and pretend that it's rubbish, but they leave it on the car because it's two tenths faster. I'm not that guy. I'm very honest. Um, but I just, I just think honesty is the best policy in motorsport to, to actually go fast as a team. Um, but I, I do think if you can always try and just be nice and be first, it does really help. So I'm just, I'm trying to keep doing that at the moment. Uh, yeah. stop. You've had You've had years of it, mate, and you've always been honest, and you know that's why you're much loved in our paddock. And it was great to see you back a few years ago after being away in World Touring Cars because you were you were missed, mate. And I was one of your big, uh, you know, big supporters when you come back and had that podium uh, with Motorbase at the first weekend, wasn't it? When you come back, was it 2017? Uh, uh, 2018. I was. Well, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, it was 2017 in the Pamax Racing Vauxhall when I hit yeah. the head, Brands Hatch. That was, that was it. That when that happened, when you got out of the car and went, yes, and hit your head on the thing, I was like, Tom Chilton's back. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Tom Chilton thing to do. 
hurt when I got out of that car and hit my head. It really, really hurt so much so. After I finished third at Brands that weekend, the next weekend uh, following, I was at Monza and the World Touring Cars. I, I won the race. I had a great race. Fought off Rob Huff behind me in the same car, and I, I, I won the race. And I got out of the car, and the first thing I did was I looked above me before I stood up out the Citroen because I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you, actually, Tom. What was it like to, to dovetail those both, uh, the World Touring Car Championship and the British Touring Car Championship? Um, in 2017, you did both series. I think you missed Silverstone because you had an operation, didn't you? But oh, yeah. You did but, everything, but... Yeah, so uh, it, they're very different cars. Uh, they're both front-wheel drive cars, but one is an absolute thoroughbred uh, of a race, race car. Uh, the Citroen was so quick. Um, you, you move the throttle pedal, I'm not joking, one millimetre, and it's like you got 400 horsepower in a millimetre. So it was like, you had to be so careful on the <clears> throttle. Um, and I blipped the throttle going down each gear in the car with my with my with my, um, my foot, and then the, and the got to the British touring cars, and you almost have to go half throttle every time before going down the gears to get it to do a little blip because the engines are a lot <laughs> very unresponsive compared to uh, to that car. There's a very big difference in price, you know. The the World mm-hmm. Touring Car had like unlimited budget with Citroen, and and uh, they spent 14 million euros just on their engine program, for example. Um, whereas our sort of thirty thousand pounds <laughs> on our on our engines in the Breed CC are, are very different, you know. Because it was a Swindon engine, it's very different beast. Um, but the 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 tyres were different as well. Uh, makes a massive difference the tyres, and also there's a flat floor in the World Touring Cars, a bit of downforce. Um, but I tell you what, the World Touring Cars, mate, I got to say it, and there's a lot of Breed CC people watching this. The, that car was the best ever front-wheel drive touring car I've ever driven in my life. It was so much fun to drive. Regardless of being fast, and I was successful in it, it was genuinely on the limit, a knife edge, and so much fun. I guess that's how Matt Neal describes the super touring days with the skinny, tall tyres on his old sort of Nissan. He describes it like that. That's how the world touring car Citroen was. But this was set up by Sebastian Loeb, nine times world rally champion, and it was set up by a Van Muller, who was 10 times Andreas Trophy ice racing champion. And they had a bit of a pissing competition on how much oversteer you can set up in a car. And when I first got on it, I nearly spun just hitting the brake pedal with the steering wheel straight with heated tyres. Right? They had, you know, had heated tyres before leaving the pit lane. Not like the BTs, you've got to warm your tyres up. I had heated tyres and I hit the brake pedal hard in a straight line and I nearly spun it in a straight line. And I said, how on earth do they stop it? It's got like... It's got so much like rotation at the rear. Oh yeah, you've got to use lots of throttle under brake. I was like, eh? Why do you need lots of throttle under brake? You just use the brake when you want to stop. Now nah, you've got to lock the diff up. <laughs> so much effort, but it took me a year to learn how to drive it. And when you're trying to learn something that wild with street circuits or the Neuschleife ring or Macau or wherever you're going with crazy high speed corners with barriers or trees, you don't want to be going oh, I don't want to turn in, I'm going to spin. You're going in at 170 miles an hour. They're really fast. And because it had a flat floor, when you even just lifted off the throttle and the front dips, you had like 300% front downforce because you'd run the rear wing flat because you had like one and a half K long straight. So you ha- it was on a knife edge, but <laughs> it's just amazing to drive. I got a lap record around the noise life ring and I, every lap, every corner you think, am I going to die? But it's just, you get through it and get on with it. It's mega. I wish I had a hot ride lap around it, Paul. You, you, I think you- where? <laughs> hey, I don't. I don't even like going around Brands Hatch Indy, mate, in a Clio Cup car. So that <laughs> Norse life in a World Touring car is not not for me. There's a question for you, mate. Um, what do you think then? Because I think you're the most qualified, one of the most qualified to answer this. Drivers from when you started, oh two, oh three, oh four, five, against the drivers now that you see now since you've been back. Um, from world touring cars. What do you see? What do you think of them? Are they as good? Are they better? Are they worse? Interesting. Um, so when we first started the BTCC, the biggest thing I would say is there were very big lap time differences between uh, the field, between like the first row, the second row, the third row. They're quite big um, lap time differences. Now all the cars were slightly different and the regulations were a bit freer so everyone could kind of build what they were trying to build for their, their manufacturer at the time. So, but 
there were big gaps in lap time um, and people used to make silly overtaking manoeuvres and Gabrielli Tarquini still does them in the World Touring Cars, what I call silly overtakes. He does, mate. He hit me so many times. He's even worse than Plato, mate. Like, Tarquini was the worst. But, like, they, they do these crazy lunges because they've been in it since black and white TV days and they think that it's acceptable, but it's not. Um, but the younger drivers coming through are doing a lot of simulator work. They've got like me, mate, I've got psychologists, I've got physios, I've got nutritionists, I've got fitness trainers, I've got, a PR, I've got two, three PR teams, I've got the whole shabam. And, and you have to be like that to be at the top. Whereas when I first joined, I didn't need any of that and I, I could get a podium. But now you've got to have all of this behind you and you've got to be working every single day at it to, to stay in the top 10. I mean, I do think that it's more competitive now. But when I look back at, you know, when I was racing in it with Matt Neil. He's still exceptionally quick. Um, and you've got the likes of Gabrielle Tarquini still doing it. James Thompson, he, he's still fast, mate, on his day. He, James is still quick on his day. Uh, Anthony Reid is, is, is bald. I was going to say balding, but he is bald. <laughs> Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Reid, you know, to this day, if you put him in a touring car, he'll still be within a tenth and a half of us. Mm. You know, and he's, he's an old boy now. Um, but he would still be right on it. You know, they're born with it. You, you've still got the, the fastest guys are still the, you know, some of the fastest guys out there. But the difference is now is there's just more of them. There is definitely more special drivers. In the old days, you might go, oh, there was like two or three special drivers. I'd now say the BTCC at the moment has sort of 15, maybe 14 really good drivers in it. And yeah, it helps if you're in a better team and better car to be at the front more often. But there's some seriously good drivers out there. Um, and, and that's what's tougher. And when you've got like what feels like the whole grid covered within one second, whereas in the old days, one second might be top eight. It's now top 20 or 20 or 28. Um, so that, I would say it's got more competitive. Yeah. Um, and the world touring cars for me was a bit of an eye opener because uh, it's, is longer laps and the lap times are still just as close. So as much as the lap times are really close on these short circuits in the UK, when I was going to like six kilometer long circuits, like the Slovakia ring or a 16 kilometer long lap at the noise life ring and everyone's still within a second, you go it's close. <laughs> Fair play lads. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And actually then, can I ask you when you come back, Who's been the most impressive person that you haven't raced against before, or youngster, or who you know? Who who's been the most impressive, Tom? Impressive youngster. Yeah, or impressive person that's new to British touring cars that you know that wasn't there when you were there. Um, that's a good question. It's probably Ash Sutton, isn't it? Yeah, I'd go with that, mate. Yeah, I'd say Ash Sutton as a young driver coming in, you know. Jason did push hard, let's be honest, and Jason hasn't lost it. You know, he won the last race last year at Brands Hatch GP and the Vauxhall. Jason's still got it when he wants to. And he actually pulls his finger out his bum, he's still got it. But Ash that was every time ahead of him. And there was only one round I particularly remember where Jason actually went flat out on that Subaru. And it was at Croft. And Ash still picked him to pole and still beat him. Um, so I'd say Ash is... Uh, Ash Sutton's definitely the best uh, sort of young driver who's come into it since I left, I can think of. Yeah, well, that's, that's cool. And you've just linked me on to the last couple of questions, mate, I'll ask you because I know you've got to go. Um, but Jason Plato, you have had, I was going to say a love-hate relationship. You've basically had a hate relationship with him. A lot of people probably don't know because you guys just seem to let it go under the carpet. But I remember him turning you round, I'd say. I think that's fair. At... Um, <laughs> twice i don't i remember silverstone and down the both do you not remember snet as well no what were you in so we'll do the first one which was 2005 uh which was at silverstone in the grandstand at the time was my mum and dad and they were sat watching the brdc grandstand next to jensen button and they both looked at each other and went what was that all about so i was leading the race in the honda and jason was behind in the seat we both pulled out about 40 meters on the field we were flying and he just went up behind me and gave me a wobble and i had a full 360 spin on the limiter in sixth gear going backwards flat spotted all my tires i had four 
canvas flat spotted tires and i still managed to pull pull it to 10th i think i finished in that race uh, with no rubber on all four tires it was horrendous uh, which was really dangerous um it's really weird when you're going backwards at 120 miles an hour and then you watch i remember matt nils and tegra i saw the front of the car dip as he braked and i was like looking at him brake <laughs> and then the whole field braking as they're coming towards me i was like Woo! flicked it there spun it back around and kept going Did a bit of a <laughs> genre, flicked it around off i went again but um <laughs> Uh, Snetterton, I was in the Vauxhall Vectra, and I was on the um, I was on the inside going in underneath the S's under bridge, and uh, you think, well, he's on the outside, he's going to lose. You know, anyone on the outside at bridge going in there is just going to lose. And he was in the seat, uh, and I think even Matt Jackson and the BMW might have been on the inside of me, and Jason was on the right hand side, the outside of me in the seat. And what he did was he just turned so hard left as we were turning left into my rear right. It spun me in a 360, turning right, going into a left-hander, went across <laughs> the field. And in my wildest like, nightmares, dreams, I never would have thought turning left I could have spun right going that way because he hit me that <laughs> rear right. It's just mind-blowing. Um, he's a complete animal. Um, oh. But I do think he's been hypnotised the last couple of years and he's actually being friendly and nice to me and he tried copying my exam results and the... Uh, and the, uh, the, so the, anyone watching, so the drivers have to do these exams now. Um, so if you don't know the rules and regulations, they have the right to say you're not allowed to race because you, you clearly don't know the rules, um, which is great. I think it's really good. And they do it as, as well for the team managers. But basically, uh, I got first, I, I've, I got the highest score last year out of all 30 drivers. I got the highest score in the exam. Um, and, uh, but Jason was copying <laughs> my results. <laughs> me i was like you've been in this twice as long as me you must know the answers but obviously he didn't he was trying to copy um obviously didn't copy him very well because he, he didn't finish first i did um but uh, <laughs> just brilliant but it's, but it's actually friendly now and i don't know if it's because james cole my teammate is good mates with him you know my old teammate james cole he was really good friends with him from the subaru days and uh, he met up with him in the soho farmhouse and i i think maybe I think maybe uh, James has said, actually, Tom's actually a nice bloke. And I think Jason's been friendly to me because James said Tom's nice. I think that's what's happened. But it's very strange and odd. It's weird because I just remember there being a massive needle between you. But you were, you know, like lately, you've always been respectful of him. And like the first thing you said was Jason's still got it. He's quick. And there wouldn't be a lot of people who'd back him like that. As a driver, you know, you'd be like the first to throw him under the bus. But you, you drive with him. You said, you know, he's on it. I know he's on it. He's won the last round. But he's always, he's, always, he's always spoke quite respectfully as well of your brother when he led the Indy 500 at, in, in 2017, I think that was. Um, so, yeah, I, like you say, I, I like Jason, you know, sometimes he's difficult, but you've got to respect what he's done, haven't you, over the years? Absolutely. He's, he's had, he's had what, 98 or 99 wins. Um, you know, I've had like 16 or something. It's nowhere near. I've been in it a long time um you know he you don't get that many wins if you're not good and you don't go to sleep and wake up the next day and lose it you can mm. still start at 60 years old and be fast you know you don't lose it um gabrielli tarquini is a great example of that he's the oldest of all of them and he was still world touring car champion a couple of years ago uh that says it all you you you, you, you still got it you know and and it's about keeping fit and tarquini he did run, I think, the marathon the other day and still under four hours, which is epic for his age. So he's still... He's an alien, mate. He ain't real. <laughs> alien, doesn't he? With his baldy heed. <laughs> he has about 18 um, espressos before he gets in the car. And but... I am not... I don't concern myself with all of that. that huh? I can I, imagine him. I had like... that espressos. I'll be shaking and I'll just hit the barrier. <laughs> <laughs> Man Muller was the same. He used to, like... I remember he was, like... We used to call him Sega Frido. He'd be, like, flat out with, like, 58 espressos and then come out and just be, like, round Thruxton 10 seconds quicker than everyone else. You know the <laughs> Van Muller does? After being teammates with him and always looking at his onboards and stuff, the best thing he does is when he's just starting his qualifying lap and he's going over the start line, is he just grabs, like, um, sleeve on his arm and he just gives it a little, uh, little pull. He just gives it a little pull, like, I am a Van Muller. And he just pulls his arms, whew, and you know, six gear, and then that's it. He's off. But it's just—it's brilliant. You are so oh, right. I remember watching a rerun of Thruxton in 03, and he we were both in Vauxhalls. And I remember he was—he was just flat through church every time. The cars were two liters. 
normally aspirated, lighter, nimble, not as fast into the corner. You could do it flat on old tyres just about. Definitely. But like, Ever. for everyone else, it wasn't flat, mate. And he was just, I remember I'm on board and he just like pulls his little thing up and he just turns in. And I was like, my word, he's just, I mean, you're, you've had him as a teammate and all these other great people. It, it's just a privilege, isn't it, mate? You've, you've done ever so well. But listen, moving on to, last question for you, because I know you've got to go, mate. Moving on to this year with BTC Racing, Bert Taylor, all them guys, Josh Cook, Creasy as your teammates, dream come true. You're back in a Honda. You love a Honda, mate. Everywhere else you go, you just seem to come back to a Honda. and it's, You look happy as Larry, mate. I'm happy, mate. I've, I've done a lot of testing in it, and uh, it's a fantastic car. The team's great. Bert has put an epic, an epic team together. I have literally got the cream of the crop. I've got the best engineers, mechanics, PR team, car. You know, I've actually got a brand new car. I don't know if people know this, but Team Dynamics were building a brand new chassis for Matt Neal for this year, for his 30th year in the BTCC. And Bert managed to buy that chassis off Dynamics. So I have Matt Neal's 30th limited edition car, if you like, for this year. Um, I've, so I've got a brand new chassis. Yeah, cheers, mate. Uh, but it's, you know, he's done everything he can to get me the best. He's like, Tom, we're going to try our absolute hardest to win the championship. Um, and uh, And we won't stand for anything less. And that's what I'm about, mate. I go in it flat out and Bert has gone in flat out with me and uh, the team he's got at the moment, I think is the strongest on the grid. And I'm kind of hoping we can show that when the, when the season finally gets off underway, but you know, um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, mate. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, of course, mate. But listen, I know you've got kids to put to bed and all sorts of family stuff to do, which I don't have to do because I'm not stupid. Um, listen, you're it. You're an absolute gent, mate. It's been a pleasure to know you all these years um, and it's been great to have raced against you. Thank you for coming on Pitch BTCC. Um, if you can say thank you to everyone else who's been asking questions, but because we've had such a great chat, we've not had a chance to, uh, to answer them. But, mate, it's a pleasure. Your family are lovely. You're a lovely man. And, uh, yeah, peace out, Lid, and I'll catch you soon, son. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye, mate.